I want to thank everyone again, Joyce, the panelists, David, that was a great start to the day. I was apprehensive about doing this at all, and uh, there's something kind of getting over the hump as we do it, and to be in the company of people so focused, so strongly supported, is incredibly heartening. Mm, we took on some very broad questions in our first round today, and now we're going to hear more about the new initiative here at Whitehead, which is in, strikes me in many ways, is revolutionary. We're going to hear from four Whitehead members who will present the keynote collectively, present the keynote address today, Cancer, Treating the Untreatable. Um, once we've heard from them, we will dive in again for conversation and we'll again welcome your questions. And I know I can't get to them all, but we really do welcome them. And so as you're listening, once again, cards to the end, and they will make their way to the front of the hall. Go to hear first from Bob Weinberg, again, the inestimable who schooled me this morning here, so, <laughs> so sort of gently. And, um, and also from the leader of Whitehead's cancer initiative, Rick Young. Uh, Richard Young is an internationally recognized authority on cell circuitry and was recognized by Scientific American as among the top 50 leaders in science, technology, and business. His work on the mechanisms that control genes in living cells has important implications for our understanding of cancer and the development of new diagnostics and therapeutics. In 2006, Rick invented a revolutionary technology that can be used to monitor exactly where proteins bind to sites on the genome. Known as Chip on Chip, this tool was a major contribution to the scientific community and quickly became the gold standard for mapping the regulatory circuits that control the cell state. You'll see how important that is to what we're about to hear. Um, Rick Young and Bob Weinberg, it's over to you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today for, uh, for several reasons. First of all, to see so many friends. Uh, secondly, uh, to be here with my pal Bob Weinberg. I'm here to keep him honest. I, <laughs> I just have to warn you, uh, ever since we became close ski buddies, um, we've been inseparable. And uh, if it sounds like we're constantly insulting one another, it's out of love and affection. Another I'm here to keep him honest. <laughs> it, it's also a pleasure today because uh, it's wonderful to have in the audience uh, my, one of my best friends, Jay Bradner, who uh, I think, uh, should this go awry, you can accuse of being responsible for initiating my uh, passionate interest in solving this cancer problem. And uh, finally, I, I'd like to say that uh, what I'm going to talk about today is something akin to what I think all of us have gone through in some part of their lives. There's, I'm sure for most of you, there's been a, a moment that really changed your perspective on things and caused you to become very determined to solve a problem. And that's where we are today. So I want to tell you a little bit about this. I'm going to describe what I think is a, an exciting new initiative here at Whitehead. It's a new vision to understand and treat the untreatable cancers. Uh, it's inspired by some recent game-changing discoveries that have occurred in labs here and in labs in collaboration with uh, these Dana-Farber researchers that we've had here this morning. And it involves solving four puzzles that uh, I think will reveal key principles that govern human health and disease. And so the three spaces that we're going to cover this morning is the reality of cancer today, uh, the assertion that the big challenge in cancer, especially for these untreatable, difficult to treat, aggressive cancers, is resistance, and this new approach that uh, I promise to talk about today. So what's the reality of cancer today? Uh, if you consider cancer from the perspective of this diagram of a family, if you have three daughters, 
The odds are that one of them will be diagnosed with cancer in her lifetime. If you have two sons, the odds are that one of them will be diagnosed with cancer in his lifetime. And right here, we see a, a complexity that we have to wrestle with because we don't really know what fraction of these women who are diagnosed actually have a disease that will eventually become life-threatening or simply reflects the enormous powers of diagnosis that we now have that we lacked a generation ago. Now we can detect the tiniest specks. And the question is, uh, do we get rid of those specks or might they just sit there for the next 60 years without ever becoming clinically apparent? That's something we wrestle with every day and it's still unresolved. And so this burden is obviously an emotional one, uh, but it's also a financial one in the US alone. It's a $125 billion per year burden. Cancer and heart disease stand out as the two major causes of death in the US. So uh, approximately a quarter of all of us will die of cancer. It's clear how to reduce deaths due to heart disease. Um, as Bob's described to some degree today, it's also clear that we can reduce the levels of cancer by uh, our behavior. Uh, but it's very important, I think, that we do much more to learn how to prevent and treat cancer. There are specific cancers that uh, are responsible for the greatest uh, mortality. Uh, I've listed a subset of what we're calling the deadliest cancers. These are cancers that cause uh, more than 50% mortality within five years of diagnosis. And they include a spectrum of cancers that you've heard about this morning, from uh, lung to metastatic breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. These all involve tumor cells that have acquired the ability to overcome all our defenses. And we'll discuss a little bit in a moment. How and we at, do and this. Like, unlike breast cancer, where mortality has declined in a very real way, for many of these cancers, for almost all of them, the, the mortality statistics really have not changed over the last generation. They really, uh, many of these really represent, in effect, death sentences as much as they did 30 years ago. We do have ways to treat these cancers. There are a number of standard treatments ke surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. These treatments can and do save lives, but uh, they are disfiguring and they're extremely toxic. And you, as you know, successful surgery relies on the complete removal of tissues harboring tumor cells. So if these tumor cells have spread, it's ultimately futile. Chemotherapy relies on the principle that a poison administered to the whole body will kill tumor cells somewhat more effectively than normal cells. Sometimes this is true, and sometimes it's the chemotherapy that kills you. How toxic are these regimens? So the original chemotherapeutic is mustard gas. It's a chemical warfare agent you may remember from uh, over half a century ago. It's still used in some regimens. It's still used in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Similarly, radiation relies on the principle that DNA damaging radiation administered to an affected area of the body is going to kill tumor cells more effectively than normal cells. It is highly destructive to normal tissue and can induce new cancers. These are really terrible options. These, I think, in the future will be viewed as, as really quite brutal. There are new approaches. And they're really exciting. And you read about them in the newspaper every day. And this is, these are the three key new approaches, targeted therapy, immuno-oncology, and precision medicine. I'll tell you about more of these approaches, but first I want to remind you of what you heard this morning. The key challenge is resistance. And when I say resistance, I mean at least two kinds of resistance. Intrinsic resistance, so this, these are tumors that already have the ability to defend themselves against that therapy, or adoptive resistance, tumors that do respond to the initial therapy, but somehow gain the ability to come back. And we'll talk a little bit about how that occurs. So if we go back to targeted therapy, targeted therapy is 
a, a, a therapy that has actually come about through a very clever scientific process of understanding how a cancer gene or its product is playing a role in a cancer and targeting that typically with a chemical molecule. The problem is that tumors are heterogeneous populations of cells. By the time you detect them, it's highly likely that they're not a unique, identical cell type. They're heterogeneous populations where a subset of the tumor cells have acquired alterations that already leads them to be resistant. So while you may have some tumor cells like these growing large here, they're these purple cells over here on the edge, may at the time that you initiate the therapy have already acquired the ability to circumvent that therapeutic. Here, here we hear, by the way, an echo of the theme of evolution, because this is evolution not occurring on, in the ecosphere, not among species. This is evolution where a small subset of cells escapes initial killing and becomes the ancestor of a whole successor population i.e. evolution occurring within the microcosm of a tissue. So here's the bad news. Here's some targeted therapies and their results for a variety of very aggressive cancers, the name of the drug, the various uh, genetic targets that have been successfully targeted through uh, medicinal chemistry. But what are the results? The results are typically to expand, extend the lifetime from diagnosis by a few months. Immuno-oncology, this is really exciting. The immune system, if you think about it in terms of infectious disease, is designed to recognize a foreign invader and attack it. And it'll do it through antibodies that you know about. And it'll do it through cells that have on their surfaces antibody-like molecules that can seek out foreign invaders. And some tumor cells, because of their altered genome or altered epigenetics, are producing proteins that can be recognized by your own cells, as shown here, that will then attack and kill tumor cells, as shown in this uh, greenish cell. But to the extent that this is true, most tumor cells also learn how to suppress that immune response. And the exciting parts of immune oncology is the discovery that there are some proteins that are involved in this inhibition by the tumor cell of the immune response that now can be drugged. And this can have a profound effect on patients. Unfortunately, it only works in some cancers, and when it works in some cancers, it only has these profound effects on a subset of those individuals. And so, for reasons that we do not completely understand, this, these breakthroughs in immune oncology are only working for a subset of patients, and they have a terrible side effect. The side effect is very frequently an autoimmune syndrome develops in those patients that do recover from that immune therapy. Precision medicine. You've heard the president announce an initiative of precision medicine. This is very exciting. You hear a lot about precision medicine. This is, in effect, taking a patient and looking at that patient's disease from many different perspectives, sequencing the tumor cells, looking at the environment in which the patient lives. And here, there's an effort to circumvent the resistance that commonly limits the effectiveness of targeted therapies by combining targeted therapies. Much akin to what you do when you have uh, antibiotic resistance, you can reduce the effects of acquired antibiotic resistance by treating a patient with combinations of antibiotics in some cases. However, this doesn't always work. It's complex, it's expensive, and it turns out it's still defeated by resistance. So we have a new approach, and we're quite excited about this approach. As I said, it's inspired, at least in part, by the ability of the four labs here to solve some specific puzzles. And I want to tell you a little bit about this, this new approach. So to do this, I have to give you an analogy. If you think about how a computer works, you have a circuit board, you have circuits within that circuit board, 
And if we look at a diagram of such circuitry, here you see with these golden lines and a few white lines, circuits that are on with a background of additional circuits here that are not being used at any particular time. And so if we think about the hardware of a computer, you have, you have a circuit board. That's all potential circuitry that can be used. And if you think about the software, at any one time the software is using a subset of that hardware, and that's the operating system. By analogy, your hardware is the 24,000 genes that are encoded in your genome. That genome is the same in every single cell in your body, in your 30 trillion cells. But of course, the thing that makes a heart cell different from a brain cell from a skin cell is the operating system, is the subset of all those genes that are turned on or utilized in that cell. So every cell has the same genome, but each cell is using a subset of that hardware, and that's its operating system. So we want to, we want to understand then what a cancer cell operating system looks like. And here's a diagram that represents what may happen. If the healthy cell has this circuitry on, uh, in the background of a hardware that encompasses 24,000 genes, what typically occurs in a cancer cell is an alteration that leads to what we call mis misexpression or disexpression. It's the, it's the turning on of a genetic circuit that is inappropriately on in that cell. It's often a circuitry that was on in embryonic cells and uh, and the cancer cells have learned to turn it back on inappropriately. And so that's illustrated here by uh, this particular line. Note, by the way, some interesting uh, implication of this diagram, because what goes on in a cancer cell is actually a very subtle variation of what exists in all normal cells. It's not as if cancer cells are 100% different from normal cells. They may be 0.1% difference. And right there, we have the challenge of therapy, how to kill the cancer cell and not obviously to kill the cells in adjacent normal tissue. So with targeted therapy, we could figure out what genes are misexpressed here and target them. But again, that is not proven to be a successful strategy for these most aggressive, strat for these most aggressive cancers. So why do we think this, this may help us? Well, I rem I'll remind you, tumors are heterogeneous populations of cells. So I'm going to show you here a diagram. You just saw this. This is a, an alteration that's occurred in a tumor cell within a single tumor. Within that same tumor, there may be another cell that has misexpressed a set of genes that are represented by this other circuit. So now you have two different circuits that are active within this same tumor. So how does this operating system view help? Well, if we look carefully here, there's a common node. There's a common position in these two operating systems that is contributing to these differential circuits. And it's that common node that we think is critical to target. And it's the technology that we have here that allows us to identify these common nodes. So just to briefly review where I've taken you so far, current approaches, the ones we're excited about, targeted therapy, Single targets lead to resistance. Immune oncology, it's an exciting new area. It should advance in important ways, but it has yet to solve these problems for these most aggressive cancers in most patients. Precision medicine, we still get resistance. It's complex, it's expensive. We'll continue to work on it, but it does not appear on its own to be the solution. By looking at the cell's operating system, we get a high level view we can see the whole system and identify key regulators. We can identify the common vulnerable nodes in these heterogeneous tumors that would allow us to focus on what is most vulnerable and limit this development of resistance. And we hope this applies to large classes of patients in the same way that a particular tumor in an individual may have heterogeneous populations of cells. Different patients with the same tumors have this problem of heterogeneity. And our hope is that we can apply this new strategy to address the tumors in many different individuals. This isn't a pipe dream. This is working. 
This is working in part because of collaborations that Jay Bradner and I have initiated uh, some time ago that we've now expanded to other research collaborations. And this is a paper that we published just a month ago in Cell with what I think is an incredibly exciting finding. In triple negative breast cancer, one of the most aggressive cancers, we call it triple negative because we don't have positive markers that are easy to identify. So it's the absence of three markers that we use. These patient cells are so heterogeneous, so diverse in the way that they've perverted the, the uh, normal cell operating system that it's hard to find a target for therapy. But what's interesting is we found a common node. And this node we found with, uh, uh, with the help of Nathaniel Gray's lab and Gene Zhao's lab. And the common node here is a kinase called CDK7. We used to think this was a general regulator of all gene control in all cells. But it turns out it is a critical, common, and vulnerable node in all the triple negative breast cancer cells we tested in preclinical assays. So we're quite excited about this. And, and even though these triple negative breast cancers are genetically heterogeneous, one patient to another, even though they may have distinct mutant genes, this treatment affects all of that class of breast cancer. So it transcends the subtle differences that are uh, dictated by the genetic aberrations that are present in various individual tumors. So I told you there were four puzzles. And there's a team of us who are interested in solving these puzzles. My puzzle is how do you take a look at the whole circuit diagram of a cell? And we do that with technologies we've developed that actually allow us to map out where key regulators operate across the genome. David Sabatini, David's interested in finding the specific vulnerabilities. He's, he's interested in finding every single site in that operating system where an attack would lead to cells that are incapable of developing resistance, at least in the test tube. And he uses a technology he'll talk about in a minute called CRISPR. Bob Weinberg, he needs no introduction. He's one of the world's experts in metastasis. We need to understand how metastatic cells, cells capable of leaving an initial tumor and migrating through the body to new sites, we need to stop those cells. Piyush Gupta, Piyush is, uh, will tell you in a minute how he looks at the dynamics of these cells in a three-dimensional construct that is quite different than the history of looking at tumor cells on flat dishes. So here's our vision. We want to take patient cells and we want to learn about the operating systems of their specific tumors. We want to identify the shared nodes that represent vulnerabilities in all the cells of their tumors. We want to discover the role of those vulnerable targets in metastasis and in these 3D culture systems. And we want to work with medicinal chemists to develop new small molecules that will be lead compounds that we can then provide to the pharmaceutical industry to advance them into the clinic. This is not our first rodeo. We've done this kind of thing before. You can see here um, President Clinton with this gentleman who's uh, getting an award for some discovery of some early oncogene, I think. This was, <laughs> this was in the midst of the so-called Lewinsky affair. I'll let Bob describe his role in that. In that. <laughs> David Sabatini, one of the world's experts in your metabolism, actually has solved one of the fundamental signaling pathways that allows cancer cells to look outside and see the cells that they are fooling, the normal healthy cells that uh, need to provide a niche for these cancer cells to make a successful tumor. Piyush Gupta has been involved in the discovery of compounds effective against cancer stem cells, some of the earliest cells that represent a kind of embryonic state for tumor cells. And uh, I've been involved, as I've just described, in pioneering this effort to look at tumor cells and normal cells from the perspective of this circuitry. 
These discoveries don't just stay here. They're, they move off into the commercial world where um, we have people who are much more experienced than we at uh, developing therapies that become clinically successful. To do this and to do it soon, we passionately want to get this job done soon, and we'd like to do it in the next five years. We need about $50 million. We need that to support these talented young scientists. Bob described our problem now in convincing the world's best and brightest who come here for training to stay and become the next generation of great young scientists. They are not persuaded that the future of this is a healthy fiscal environment. We need support for the experimental and computational equipment to examine these patients' tumors. And we need support for the biological, chemical, and cell culture materials that allow this to happen. Thank you very much. So even though I was tasked with the job of keeping Mr. Goodlooking honest, as you may sense, I had rather little to do. <laughs> Can I put a question or two? Please. Uh, and we'll sit with the whole panel before we're finished. But um, this, this should be a quick question, but maybe it's not going to be. Um, I saw the PowerPoint. Uh, we all feel like we have the sense of what the computer language means, circuitry and so on. But for just a second, could you take it out of the metaphorical language of circuitry and software and operating systems and just put it in biological terms? And I'm asking this as an ignoramus will probably be overwhelmed when you do that, but I'm a little suspicious of my ease with computer mm -hmm. lingo, and I'm not sure that that sets me up to conceptually. While it's, it's a very good way in, I'm not sure I really know what that means. Now, that's yep. probably a question that would take four days to answer, but. No. No, I'll try it this way. What is very, what's been very straightforward for us is to take a patient's tumor and to sequence that genome and to identify differences in that sequence. So mm -hmm. those are genetic alterations, and it, it's made it, uh, I wouldn't say straightforward, but it's made it possible for chemists like Jay Bradner to have a target to drug. Mm -hmm. what, what is different, though, from this perspective is there are protein molecules that are occupying portions of that genome that are operating on each gene, that are molecular switches that turn these genes on and off, mm -hmm. and that are connected to other genes because they act cooperatively with other genes to do this. Mm -hmm. And this is this epigenetic space. It's the, it's the decorations on the genome that I like to think of actually as the controllers. And those are proteins as well. And they, by clever chemists like Jay, like Nathaniel Gray and others, are also druggable. So, so these are new kinds of targets that we think of as ex is representing exceptional vulnerabilities for and, these two. And why cells. are these better targets? Are they less diverse and therefore less targetable than Looking at the whole, is there some, some consistency that uh, here, if you understand the control systems, you can go at them across a, a, a wider range, or the range is simply narrower? What, what I think Jay Bradner taught us is that instead of targeting a specific part of a pathway mm -hmm. that tumor cells can quickly circumvent by going down another pathway, mm -hmm. you can do something that's quite counterintuitive. You can target a regulator that works across the entire operating system and without killing all normal cells, destroy the tumor. These are master regulators? These are master regulators. And, and is there any doubt about the existence of master regulators? No. I think not. Not in my laboratory. Just However. <laughs> is, that, However. is that true, Bob? <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, With your Lewinsky fact, experience? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Master regulator sounds kind of. I, 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 I'm left, spe I'm left speechless, uh, uncharacteristically. Uh, the fact is that uh, Rick just gave you concrete evidence that there are such master regulators. He talked about CDK7 as an example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which has a surprisingly large role in a whole diverse 
variety of, in one case, triple negative breast cancers, mm -hmm. even though an examination of their DNA would lead one to think these triple negative breast cancers all have different perturbations of the regulatory circuits that mm -hmm. operate within individual cells to determine whether or not the cell will grow or not grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's one right there. There's one, and he knows about others, which mm -hmm. have not been cited today. All right, you begin to build the ramp for my understanding, and I hope others, and we'll come back to it with the entire group. But thank you, Bob Weinberg, Rick Young. Thank you. We'll come back in a moment for more. Thank you very much. <laughs>